Hello everyone. Last week we were not able to have our sermon online. We had some technical difficulties. So we've been hearing messages that some of you wanted to see and hear last week's message as we opened up our new sermon series, Facing the Giants. Now, we started last week looking at the book of Joshua. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to be reading from verses 2 and 3. Ready? Now Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever your foot sets, sets foot, you will be on land I have given you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this message. We thank you that, that you can bless us, even though, Lord, we probably are not in the same room. Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is here. So please take this conversation, take these thoughts of mine, and Lord, I just ask that it may be a blessing to others as it has been a blessing to me. In Jesus' precious name. Now, what are these numbers? And, and, and let me just say, 2, 40, 30, 59. Now, numbers don't lie, but these numbers are not last night's lotto winners. These numbers tell us something that in the book of Joshua, we're going to soon find out. Let's take the, book, the number 2. 2 is a very special number in the book of Joshua because if you go back into the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers, just 39 years prior, Joshua and Moses were at the very gate of entering Canaan. And Moses sends out 12 spies to look at the territory where they were going to soon conquer but only two of them came back. You see that number two represents only two of the 12 came back with, with energy, with enthusiasm, with passion, saying, yes, we can take these people, but we know what happens. The popularity, the group uh, was that no way, God cannot help us. Therefore, the 10 were overpowering and told Moses and the people, we can't go into to the land of Canaan. They are so big, they, they make us feel like grasshoppers too. 40. 40 is the amount of years that after that event, it says, the Bible says in Exodus that they wandered in the desert. You see, when, when they left Egypt, they were in the desert for about a year. For about a year, but even in the desert, God provided for them. But when this event took place, that these 12 spies were sent off, because of them believing the other 10, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And everybody who left Egypt, everybody who left Egypt, only two of them crossed into Jordan. All those who crossed into Jordan were the generation of the children who were born in the desert. Tragically, we know what, what happens when, when these people did not obey, did not trust God. What about third? Well, Moses leads the people out of Egypt, but falls short to cross into Jordan. And Moses, their general, their leader, their spiritual father, you could say, dies in the desert. And for 30 days, the people mourn his loss. For 30 days, they are wondering and questioning what's going to be of them. Are they going to have a new leader? Will Joshua be able to lead them forward? And finally, 59. What is 59? Well, this is the, the age that scholars believe that Joshua was when he took on the leadership when he took on the, the, the baton to cross the finish line, to finish what, what Moses had started. 2, 40, 39, and 59. But now, 
I said that numbers don't lie. Numbers tell us something, but let me just say that oftentimes we hear things like, well, the odds are against you. Uh, this will never, will never happen. There's no way that this could happen. Or, or perhaps we've heard this one. We've tried that already and it didn't work. You see, sometimes numbers don't lie, but sometimes numbers don't give us all the truth. Here's another number. 5,126. You might ask, well, what's this number now? 5,126 is the amount of times that James Dyson successfully created a vacuum without a bag. 5,126 times. That means when he was at 5,120, he failed. You mean that when he was at 5,123, he failed. What do we know about 5,126? That it was 5,126 times that he failed, that he finally was successful. Thomas Edison is known to have said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. You see, numbers don't lie, but failure cannot be measured. You see, as we look into the story of Joshua, before we get started, we want you to know that there are giants in this land. And when God tells Joshua to go into the land of Canaan, there are giants, there are things that are perhaps bigger than he ever imagined. But before he slayed the first giant, the first giant that stood before him and Canaan was the giant of failure. What is failure for you? What does failure mean to you? Now, do you know that there's an actual medical term for failure? Say it with me. It is akitiphobia. Say it with me. Atikiphobia. Atikiphobia, the, the dictionary says that our individuals coping with antikiphobia can experience crippling self-doubt and extreme fail, fear of failure due to the perceived ridicule one might face after a failure. Atikiphobia can severely affect the quality of life for the sufferer. They may go out of their way to taking or avoiding taking a risk on even the smallest level. You might think that you might have some of this. Maybe you haven't been diagnosed, but, but you know what failure looks like. You know what, what you've tried and, and didn't succeed in. And that has caused a callus in your mind. That has caused a scar that you, perhaps every time you go through it, you rehearse the same thing. You're going to be a failure. You're going to be a failure. You see, we know that numbers don't lie. But failure cannot be measured. Why? Because we've seen it in people. We've seen it in people coming to church. That they say, well... I don't know if I can go back. People remember too much about me. I made too many promises and, and didn't come through. You see, this failure idea mentality is an imagined is an imagined world that we have in our mind. Because let's be honest, no one remembers what we did yesterday, so no one's going to remember what you did last year. Now, we might think in our minds that people remember, but we are only rehearsing something that we only have assumed. But the Bible tells us that failure is something that God can give you victory over. Because before Joshua slays the first giant entering Canaan, the first giant he has to slay is the giant of failure. Because if we go back 40 years in the story of Joshua, it leads us to Numbers. Come back with me to Numbers chapter 13, verse 6, 7, 17. Numbers chapter 13, verse 
17. And it says, Moses gave the men these instructions as he went out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like, verse 18, and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak or few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good? Is it bad? Do their towns have walls? Are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil, is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. And it happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe crops. We already mentioned this. We already mentioned this was one year after they had left Egypt. And Moses thought of a great idea of sending 12 representatives into Canaan for 40 days. They would scout, they would survey the land, they would come back showing proof of what God was going to be able to accomplish. But unfortunately, what they carried back was doubt and fear. You see, when we have failure, we carry back with us doubt and fear. You see, Joshua has already in this story witnessed the miracle of what God did for them in Egypt. Ten times God provided a sign to show the Israelites that God was for real. Ten times God had already shown the Israelites of his promise. Not only does he deliver them from the most powerful uh, empire known to man of Egypt, but then leads them to the Red Sea and opens the Red Sea like a book. Waves of water to their right and to their left. Yes, this same Joshua had seen God's miraculous hand work in their lives. So at this point, there's no way, there's no way they could not doubt him. But unfortunately, these tents Ten spies came back with more doubt and fear than they should have. Not only, not only do these men say that they can't, but listen to what it says in verse 27 and 28. So they go for 40 days and they come back and listen to what they said. They said, this was the report to Moses. Yes, we entered the land you sent us to explore. And it is indeed a beautiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. But here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. And we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Yes, yes, Moses, everything you said is true. This place is marvelous. This place is gorgeous. This place is beyond what we can even imagine. But, but, there's a problem. Houston, there is a problem. They were so upset. They were so discouraged that they said, there's no way. There's no way we can, can, we can challenge these people. There's no way we can fight against them. They're so big. Listen to what they say in verse 31. But the other man who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than us. You see, they said the word can't. They said the word can't. We can't. So therefore we won't. Sometimes numbers don't always tell the truth. Yes, numbers don't lie, but, but fear and failure cannot be measured. Here we find these men believing that God, this time, would not be able to help them. You see, what can slay the giant of failure? Faith. Faith slays the giant every time. And if you go to the New Testament, if you go to the New Testament, 
we find in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, the definition of faith. Listen to what faith says and, 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 and what faith is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it is the evidence of things we cannot see. Summer version says, now faith is the confidence that we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see because, brothers and sisters, church online, you cannot defeat the giant of your failure with your own experience. You can't defeat the giant of your failure with more knowledge. You can't defeat the giant of failure with good intention. You can only defeat the giant of failure with faith in God. Verse 30, in that same chapter, it says, It was by faith the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and the walls came crashing down. Let me ask you this. What failure do you have in your past that is crippling you? What is it about you, and what is it about what you've experienced that keeps you from living your true potential? Because I can tell you this. Failure is something in it's not you. Now, faith in God, not in yourself or in your experience, because faith is your only safeguard. So this is the sentence I want you to repeat with me. Don't let your past failures stop. I'll say it again. Don't let your past failures stop your potential future. Don't let your past failures Stop your potential future. Joshua, like us, had failures. Joshua, like us, was nervous. Ellen White says these beautiful words in Patriarchs and Prophets that we can relate with Joshua. She says, it was with great anxiety and self-distrust that Joshua had looked forward to the work in other words, he was anxious. He was nervous. He was scared because he had been here before. He had tried and failed. But she goes on. She goes on to say, but his fears were removed by the assurance of God. He says, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Unto this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto the fathers to give to them. You see, we might be facing giants. We might be facing challenges. But with God by our side, say it with me, church, your giant will fall. With God by our side, your giant will be slain. Before you, you go out and fight other giants, the first giant you need to conquer is the giant of failure. So there's three things that I want us to think about in the story of Joshua. One, God promises always his presence, but never an easy path. Say it with me. God never promises an easy path. But rather, God promises his presence. And his presence is more than enough. Joshua chapter 1. Come back with me to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. And verse 3 to 5. Listen to what he says. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you. From Negev, the wilderness in the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be 
with you. As I was with Moses, I will not fail you, and I will not abandon you. Brothers, this is the word of the Lord. That even though you are facing the difficulty, even though you're facing the giants, even though you're facing the valleys, God's promise of his presence is never going to change. God will be with you in your moment of need. God will be with you when you least expect it. But this is the part that many of us soon quickly forget. This is the part of the contract where we call it the fine print. Because this is the part that many people forget that God has told us. That yes, God will be with us. Yes, God will bless us. But we will go through challenges. Come with me to another passage there in Exodus. Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. Listen to what God says about his promise. He says, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey and the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. If we could cut this verse in half, we would stop at the part where it says honey. It it, it stops where where we hear God's promises of his blessings. But let me tell you, his blessings are also wrapped up with his enablings. And God is enabling you today. God is giving you the victory if you want it. But you have to. You have to go into this land have to take arms. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to pull, pull, pull your sleeves up and put some elbow grease. Why? Because although God promises the land flowing with milk and honey, there's also people living there that you're going to have to. You're going to have to push and pull and fight your way through. You see, people will resist you. People will persecute you. People will hate you. But you know what? God's promise of his presence is always there for you. He will and always will be available for your rescue. The second thing I want you to know is that God promised the entire land, but they could only possess that which they claimed. Think about that. He said everywhere your foot steps. That is your land. But unless you step in the land that you want, you will not claim that. What they took, they must be fought for against a determined opposition. You see, God certainly could have eliminated all of their enemies with the mere thought. He could have just said, there, boom, they're done, gone. But he didn't. You see, on the contrary, He calls Israel into a partnership with himself to see his will done. Because taking the land took effort. But the challenge ahead was not for those who were content with Egypt, but rather those who would press ahead with what God had called them to do. See, those people who left Egypt, although they left Egypt, they still had Egypt in their We cannot reach into the heavenly Canaan if we still have Egypt in our hearts. We cannot go into the promised land if we keep looking back for the good old days. Let me just tell you, the third and final thing that we can see is that God's promises can be found when we remain in his word. Come back with me. Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. 
then you will be successful in everything you do. Study, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate it on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. And only then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. You see, God's promises can be found when we remain in his word. When you remain in him, when you follow God completely, you will prosper. Because every time God commands Joshua to be courageous, he couples the command with the divine promise. God does not ask us to be bold simply by the power of positive thinking. No. Our courage comes from accepting God's unfailing promises. So what do I want you to do? I want you to let go of the past. Let your past be in the rearview mirror. You can't drive to the future if you keep looking back. Let go of the past and give it to God. Sometimes it's easier said than done, isn't it? Sometimes it feels like our past keeps gnawing at us. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we see the past. But when you come to God, God doesn't ask you for your past. He only wants you to know what lies in your future. One commentary says, Joshua models a faith that is more than intellectual. He is willing to turn his back to the past claim the promises, meet the conditions, and give all that it will take to complete the lifelong task entrusted to him. You see, failure only stops us if we let it. Then don't let it. Don't let the past rob your present nor your future. And don't let your past failures stop your potential future, your possible because as long as we have God by our side, every giant will fall. Why? Because God will give us the victory. Because what if Joshua, what if Joshua would have believed with the other 10 spies? What if Joshua would have reminisced in the past and, and come to the conclusion that, no, we've tried this, not, not today. He would never reach his full potential. If you keep looking to the past, you miss what God can do for you today. Yes, the past has happened. Take it and accept the past. Accept what happened to you, but do not let that define you. Do not let that control you. I want to end with a passage that we've seen before, and it's found in Philippians. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi from a prison cell. Paul is writing these powerful words that today we need to hear. If you have your Bible, come with me back to Philippians chapter 3 in the New Testament. Verse 12, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection with Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but focus on one thing. What are you going to say? What are you going to tell us? What is that word? What is that phrase that we need to know today? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting the past and focusing what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Do you hear that? The counsel, the encouragement, the words of life that you need to hear today is that you need to forget your past. Slay the giant of failure with faith. 
Because faith is the evidence of things that we cannot touch. We believe. And God will give you the victory. Because if you, like Joshua, remain in his word, the Bible says you will be successful. So let me ask you this. Are you going to let your past failures rob you of your possible future? I pray that it won't. I know that it won't because God has already given us the victory through his son and through his word. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you that you, through the life of Joshua, remind us of your power. And God, some of us right now, are struggling with letting go. We keep, being, we keep being reminded. People keep telling us of our mistakes. But Father, we want to put our eyes on you. And we want to know that you've forgiven us and that we can move forward. So thank you for the life of Joshua. Thank you for allowing us to slay the giant of failure to the next giant that we will see. Bless us now. Jesus' precious name we, we ask. Amen. Thank you again for watching. We hope to see you this next Sabbath. Hopefully our technology is up and running. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Take care and God bless.